This eHIV Review Patient Voices program is presented by DKB Med Radio. Managing HIV-related comorbidities in an aging population. They survived the HIV epidemic years. And now many of them have aged well beyond the time they expected. These people living with HIV, these survivors, are now being challenged by the rigors of growing older. Lessened immunity to illnesses, increased cardiac and pulmonary conditions, musculoskeletal pain, depression, loneliness. What can their healthcare providers do to help them and what can they do to help themselves? This issue of Patient Voices is a companion piece to our recent EHIV Review newsletter and podcast publications on managing HIV-related comorbidities in an aging population. Our Patient Voices guest today is Dr. Larry Bryant, a registered respiratory therapist for more than 50 years. Diagnosed with HIV in 1995, Today, he specializes in substance use disorders and HIV-AIDS prevention, with a focus on older adults, the unhoused, and other underserved groups. He's also the founder and CEO of Passion and Purpose Behavioral Health Consulting Services, bringing his 34 years of personal experience in long-term recovery to guide others. He joins our host, Justin Alves, a nurse and nurse educator at Boston Medical Center and our EHIV Review Nursing Program Director to share the story of his journey. And now, Patient Voices. Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Justin Alms, the Program Director for EHIV Review, um, and I'm here today for our Patient Voices series for a special issue about HIV and aging, and I'm joined by Larry Bryant um, all the way from Atlanta today. Uh, Larry, I'm thrilled to have you, and I'm thrilled to sort of have this conversation with you. Thank you. And so today we are focusing on the care of people living with HIV and aging with HIV. And so I want to dive right into this. Um, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit, first and foremost, um, about your perspective as someone who is aging with HIV, um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you're doing today. Uh, When we're talking about HIV, I go all the way back to 1979 as a budding respiratory therapist at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, where I worked uh, as a respiratory therapist. And we began to see young white men come into our respiratory intensive care unit uh, with this pneumonia. And today we know that as pneumocystis pneumonia, they would go on our ventilators and they would most, for the most part, would not come off. HIV has affected me for many, many, many years. And given the fact that I always thought that I could be a candidate for that. I had no idea that I would be privileged enough uh, to be able to make it through that tumultuous 80s without any problem, uh, but always been in advocacy, always during that time we were burying our friends, sometimes two, three a day day. It just was absolutely a very tumultuous time, a lot of stigma, particularly um, associated with HIV. And as we progress through the years, I've always continued either directly or indirectly uh, dealt with HIV AIDS in an advocacy capacity. Uh, It was in 1995, after I moved to uh, Atlanta from Philadelphia, I'm from Philadelphia, that I was diagnosed with HIV. And it wasn't as if I had the courage to just go get tested. That was always very problematic for me, I guess, because I was so entrenched in the epidemic, you know, clinically as well as socially, that I just was so afraid. That's that's the only way I can, uh, you know, sort of say that. But I I went for a dental appointment. And in the dentist's office, uh, it was just a regular routine dental appointment. I think it was a new new dentist, though. And I'm sitting in the office, and he walks in the office, or or brings me into his office, and says to me, you're HIV positive. And of course, I was shocked, because I did not ask for a test. I didn't, I wasn't expecting it. 
And basically, he said that and he just left. He just walked out. Now, probably if I'd have been somebody else, that would have been more devastating than it was. But in actuality, you know, I, I, I could have made a big deal out of it. But deep down on our side, inside, I said, thank God that at least now I know. I pretty much knew um, because of my substance use that I probably was HIV. I just didn't have the, the, the confidence or the courage to get tested. But there I was, I was tested. And thank goodness it was at a time when there was medication. And ever since 1995, I must say, I've been diligent with my medication, um, adhering to my medication, and I've been undetectable since 1995, my CD4 count has never been under a thousand. And I'm just so grateful because of that. And there's, there's a lot of gratitude there, which leads me into what I do now because um, I'm in recovery, recovering from substance use for 34 years, and I'm HIV positive, but I'm undetectable. I'm grateful for that. And so, I, you know, I do the work that I do, you know, in consulting and uh, training around HIV, AIDS, around substance use, on house, because I was that person. I'm the example of what it is that I train. Well, and thank you for sharing all that. I think in your sort of conversation there, I, I heard this clear sort of delineation about maybe what the early days were like in the 80s and 90s for you being different than what they are today for you. And I'm wondering if you want to comment on what are some of the things that we worry about today with HIV that maybe just like weren't a concern for you in the late 80s and in the mid 1990s? Like what's different today for you? Oh my God, what a question. Well, the biggest thing is the fact that we are living longer. If you got a diagnosis of HIV in 1981, you didn't know if you would live throughout the month. Not only that, testing is different now than it was. You had to wait two weeks. And during that two weeks, just the hell that you went through, just anticipating, just waiting. But when you got the diagnosis, it was a death sentence. It was a death sentence. And the quagmire was, you didn't know how it was going to manifest itself. Back then, we had Kaposi sarcoma, like the cancer. And you could, there were many people walking around with these black blotches, like all over them. Some of them had them on their face. So that was a telltale sign. And so, um, uh, and the medication that we with the AZT that we uh, had to go through doing them, a lot of people say the medication was worse than the disease itself. So now we have better medication, uh, but the situation that many of us find ourselves in, and we never expected this, even in 1995, we never expected to grow, to become an elder. I don't subscribe to being a senior citizen, and I don't subscribe to being called old man. I am a community elder, but never thought that we would reach this. And so we're dealing with today a lot of age-related kinds of issues that we never expected that we would. Um, issues like um, relationships with our providers, long-term relationships, trust in relationships, um, a building on those relationships. And, uh, and so one point I want, I want to mention is that as we are aging, I turned, I turned 73 in July, I'm oh, sorry, 72 in July. So I'm a good, good, good elder, <laughs> an elder elder. And um, so we're dealing with uh, life issues. Um, so for example, um, looking at the potential for going into a nursing home at some point 
considering and thinking about that, uh, living alone and dealing with mental health kinds of issues that, you know, for many of us are fairly salient. Loneliness is a big one for persons uh, aging in recovery. Um, living alone. So, for example, one of the big issues we have to deal with is mobility and making sure that, you know, we're in the kind of space where we're protected against falls. But let me just say this one thing, and, and I hope that um, I want to thank you for giving me the time to be able to share this, because my biggest concern as an aging person with a substance use disorder with these other co-occurring conditions. And I have a substantive co-occurring conditions. One of them is um, considerable um, lower back disease and fairly severe. Um, arthritis, um, degenerative disc disease, um, you know, just, just, I'm in pain all the time. Uh, but I've learned to deal with it. Um, in my being educated around the dangers of prescription medications, being in long-term recovery, that is my biggest concern. But many, not some of my long-term recovery friends are returning to use off of opioids. And it is a, it's a red flag for me it's dangerous. It's not something that you set out to do. If you're in this pain, substantive amount of pain, you know, and, and you just can't, after you've had back surgery, you know, you, you, you got to have something. But it's very, very dangerous for uh, those of us that have long terms of recovery. One of the things that comes up is that like people get old and things happen, like people become an elder and like health stuff happens. You're talking about some pretty substantial musculoskeletal stuff, the bone on bone, your hip, your back. Um, oftentimes I have patients who like need to see the cardiologist or need to see the liver doctor, right? Um, how is it navigating all of these specialists as an elder with HIV because I, you know, I think to your point, like we didn't expect people to grow old for a long time. And now people are growing old and we're trying to figure out um, what we can do to really meet that need for folks who are aging with HIV. Do you want to talk about what it's like for you to be that person who's growing old with HIV and having to see all these specialists? As we are aging, so are our providers. So, um, Fortunately, I still have my infectious disease providers, but all my other providers that I've had for 30 years, they've retired out. And my last provider retired out. And I had to find, a, at you know, at this stage, I had to find a brand new primary uh, care provider. And that was very, very scary, very scary. So I said, Larry, look at the glass, it's half full. So um, I got, as a matter of fact, I didn't even choose this provider. They chose it for me which I didn't really like that. But I said, well, I'll go with it. So I walked into this young lady's office. Uh, uh, yeah, nice young lady. Uh, the office was very welcoming and that was a consideration. Uh, but when I went in to see her, she just was so amiable. She was so, I could tell she wasn't just putting on a front. I could tell that she genuinely cared. But when she asked me, she asked me some, some questions that in my presentations, I tell providers all the time, these are the things that you need to do in your assessment. And she did all of those things. She even asked me, this is my primary, she asked me if I wanted an STI um, test. None of my other providers, none of my non-infectious disease providers ever asked me that. So when she said that, I just said, yes, yeah, you're, you're my primary care forever. And she was young, too, so she's going to be around for a while. <laughs> but she also, before I even got there, had read my entire chart. She knew about my other 
providers, you know, the cardiac doctor, the orthopedic, she knew all of that before I even got there, which said a whole lot to me. And so if I could say anything um, is really helping providers to understand the importance of holistic care, of having your providers communicating with one another. Well, and I guess my question to you is what, as we're trying to gear up more and more primary care providers to be the quarterbacks for teams, for people aging with HIV, (laughs) what are some key pointers or reminders you would have for those maybe newer providers? One of the things that I often sort of try to bring home was this notion of cultural humility, which means that our profession, the work that we do, incorporates lifelong learning, which means that we never stop learning. We always try to educate ourselves about different cultures, educate ourselves about different diseases, um, and do this on an ongoing basis and not just sort of like a once a year um, you know, uh, module that we do at work, but no a continuously ongoing education about our own profession, as well as about other persons. So for example, you're a primary care person and you're, you're, you're dealing with HIV. First of all, you want to make sure that you're up, you're, 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 you're updated on all of the new things that are happening in the field of HIV, um, including the current culture that, Uh, many of our HIV organizations are experiencing now. Um, Learning about, you know, for example, LGBTQ population and and what they bring to the table. Uh, Looking at persons that come to the table as more than just, for example, a Black person sitting in front of you. um, What are the intersectionalities that they bring with them? Because they're more than just that person. There's their history. For an elder person, there's this comprehensive experience of stigma that we have been dealing with for years and years and years. And that can be compounded. Um, You know, uh, things like, um, you know, uh, different traumas that we've been through that impact who we are, discrimination, racism, All of these things are who you see in front of you. And it's important that we are aware about all of these um, cultural axioms as as we're interacting um, with our clients. I think that that is a great sort of takeaway message for us today. I want to thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing your experiences as an elder. I always learn from you, Larry, whenever we chat. Uh, So thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for asking me to be here. My name is Justin Alves, Nursing Program Director for EHIV Review, uh, here with Patient Voices and signing off until next time. Thanks so much for joining us today.